Dr. Woodrow Kroll is a Bible teacher, an excellent Bible teacher, and he is known for the quote that says, if the devil can't make you bad, he will make you busy. And there's never been a time where that has been a greater threat than now. And social media is now an actual addiction. In a global setting, it is now an addiction of its own and it's becoming a very serious concern because it leaves a wake of destructive consequences to its users. And the reason that I am talking about social media is because my main group of people that I serve or hear from for help is those who are in recovery or trying to be in recovery for drug and alcohol addiction. And this didn't used to be the case when I was coming out of addiction, but in the last, I would say 10 years, this has become a very prevalent problem where people come into treatment for drug or alcohol addiction and they find out all about addiction, they get free from the drug or alcohol addiction, and then they come out of treatment and they get a smartphone, which everyone has, and then immediately they're, they have anxiety because they're out of treatment, they're no longer in the safety of treatment, and so they jump on social media. It's soothing. They jump on it because it takes their mind away from the reality of I'm out here again. What am I going to do? I don't want to go to the liquor store. I don't want to go to the, the dope dealer. So I'm going to just stay on social media because it's stimulating, it's invigorating, and I'm just going to get on social media. Um, many will say that... Um, the porn sites get an even greater grab because they go there for self-soothing and then both places you get stuck. And so at that point, um, people aren't able to just lay the phone down. They're already stuck, they report, and they can't get free. And now they've lost their um, freedom to go on with their life because they're just constantly checking their phone. And they will say that what happened they ended up relapsing because of the emotional stress that comes from looking at all the social media and how bad it made them feel. Same with the porn sites, that they end up relapsing more severely than they did before because they are just consumed with all these emotions that they can't handle, weren't prepared to handle, seeing all the people that they have been friends with that are out doing all these things, still using or doing great. Either way, it's not an accurate portrayal of reality, but it ends up creating a huge mess for people who are struggling to find safety in a community out here. The social media takes them down. They will say the social media takes them down. It used to be the cigarette took me down. Now they'll say the social media took them down. And then they'll move it back into harder things to cope with how bad it made them feel. So that is such a common thing. I've heard that for so many years now that I personally have um, really cautioned people on um, managing that phone well and to not put certain apps on right away because if you want to stay up and you want to have any chance of having self-control in your life take a long extended period of time to introduce yourself to social media and never to porn because you cannot the trying to get away from that either one of them when you're already buried in it it's hard for people who are not in recovery it's very hard for everyone it is in, almost impossible for those in recovery especially right out of treatment. So I say that to caution those who are keeping them accountable, who love them, that there should be strict boundaries on the amount of time that is spent on social media when someone is trying to build a sober life. Mm -hmm. Pew Research and other sources have put out the latest facts and statistics about social media addiction, which is a genuine thing now. It is gathered from the internet and pulled from a recent survey of over 5,000 American social media users. 
They have discovered that more than 330 million people suffer from social media addiction worldwide. That's a consuming problem, meaning it, it consumes and controls their life. 7% of all social media users are addicted to social media. So that means 4.2 billion people use social media, which is roughly 55% of the world's population. The average person spends two hours and 32 minutes on social media per day. Teens spend the most time on social media with an average of three hours and one minute per day. Some teens spend up to nine hours a day on social media. Female teenagers are most likely to suffer from social media addiction. TikTok is the most addictive social media platform. And I don't even need to go into all the additional problems there are with TikTok. I'm not against any social media. I think all of it can be used in a very constructive way, but when it's not in a constructive way, these are just, some of these are deadly addictions. 73% of people sleep with or next to their phone at night, which is certainly not healthy because of all the, just 5G, all that, it's not healthy. The one person who talked to me about that said they keep their phone in a dresser drawer even just to keep that from being near them if they, they could hear it ring, but they don't want it right by their head. 50% of people caught driving while using their phone were on social media at the time. The 330 million people that are on, or that are social, that are addicted to social media, that's up from 210 million in 2019. So there was that much of a jump in two years. The five most popular platforms are Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. Although Facebook is the biggest social media platform with over 2.23 billion users, TikTok has been reported as the most addictive social media platform. But social media users spend the most daily time on YouTube. A considerable number of research studies conclude that texting and driving appears to be a significant problem in society now, especially with younger drivers. However, the reports are that 50% of people caught on their mobile phones while driving in 2020 weren't texting, they were posting selfies, updating social media posts, and some were even live streaming. 73% of people sleep with or next to their phones every night. Said of that 73%, they said they prefer sleeping with their phones beside them or under their pillow. And sadly, these people are clearly unaware of the sleep disturbances which are linked to this practice by very serious physical and mental health issues that can happen. 63% of people said that checking their phone is the first thing they do when they wake up. 78% of all Americans check social media every day. 86% of Americans have an, a, an active social media account. 86% of Americans have an active social media account. 78% of these social media users check at least one of their accounts every day with more than 60% saying they check social media several times a day. Helpguide.org reports that multiple studies have found a strong link between heavy social media and an increased risk for depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-harm, and suicide. Social media may promote set negative experiences such as inadequacy about your life or appearance, even if you know that the images you're viewing are manipulated and not even true, they can still make you feel insecure about how you look and what's going on in your life. And we're all aware that other people tend to share just highlights of their lives and rarely the low points. But that doesn't lessen the feelings of envy and dissatisfaction when you're scrolling through a friend's airbrushed photos of their beach holiday or reading about their promotions or their engagements or their new relationship. It's devastating to people if this is a continuous thing getting fed into them. Fear of missing out is another severe consequence of social media. Sites such as Facebook and Instagram seem to increase feelings that others are having far more fun and living far better lives than you are. 
The idea that you're missing out on certain things impacts self-esteem, it triggers anxiety, and it fuels greater social media use. It only makes it worse. And this compels people to pick up their phone every few minutes to check updates or compulsively respond to each and every alert, even if it means taking risks while driving, missing out on sleep at night, prioritizing social media over very real relationships. And so I'm one who, I mean, I'm, I'm not even innocent in this. I, this definitely applies to me as well. But when you go out in public and you even go to a restaurant and you look at how many people are sitting with probably family and they're all on their phones. You can go just about anywhere. You can go to the malls and see people sitting around on their phones, walking on their phones, walking in the neighborhood on their phones. It's, it's, I'm old enough to know what it was like before that when they're, um, you, the only way you could get a cell phone, it was in a, I'm really dating myself, but in a, like a canvas bag and it was something you had to carry around and plug in and it's amazing what these phones have developed into and just how much they have taken over people's lives. It also causes isolation. A study at the University of Pennsylvania found that high usage of Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram increases rather than decreases feelings of loneliness. And the study also found that reducing social media usage can actually make you feel less lonely and isolated and improve your overall well-being. Depression and anxiety is another consequence. Human beings need face-to-face -face contact to be actually healthy mentally and nothing reduces stress and boosts your mood faster than eye-to-eye -eye contact with someone who actually cares about you. And the more you prioritize social media interaction over real people, the more you're at risk for developing or accelerating mood disorders such as anxiety and depression. Another consequence of social media is cyberbullying. About 10% of teens report being bullied on social media and many other users are subjected to very offensive comments and commentary. When I even look at, it's risky for anyone to post. I have a pretty controlled, I mean, I'm careful about who my friends are. Um, I'm, I'm shocked at how a post can blow up into something it wasn't even about. I mean, somebody gets offended, they misread it, and then they start a big war on some post that you put out that was a healthy, mm -hmm. it was healthy to begin with. And you see that they didn't even read it to get crazy, but this is a common thing. And then people get drawn into reading the train wreck that happens. It's so compelling that you're just like following this thing down going, this is nuts. But it's so, it, it just is like a black hole. It just sucks people in. So Another part of that is, is the chaos on social media stimulates people, it's entertaining, it's invigorating, it makes people have all kinds of conversations around it. It's insanity is what it is. Um, social media platforms such as Twitter can be hotspots for spreading very hurtful rumors, lies, and abuse that leaves lasting emotional scars. I'm always telling women that aren't yet aware of well they just haven't been out too much on one side they are used to the other that the photos that you post that are of you in very little clothing or swimming suits bikinis um, where you're showing your cleavage intentionally everyone can tell when it's intentional it's gonna cost you. There's nothing more disillusioning than seeing someone in a ministry role, a ministry staff, someone who works leading others involved in faith that is sharing posts, drawing attention to their body shape, to their just, there's nothing more inappropriate than that. We should not be selling ourselves on social media, period. 
it's a very poor example for those if you're a leader it's very poor leading so if you want to be someone that god respects and honors and that a ministry that's respectful will want on their team don't be inappropriate in your posts and this is also for men because they tend to take off their shirt and pull their pants clear down and then they take a photo in a mirror in a bathroom and post that mm -hmm. there isn't a respectful ministry anywhere that is going to want them either and these pictures don't just disappear when you pull them down I just can't even, I can't stress that enough that just having been in ministry for as long as I have, we used to let people go for that. If the ministry is honorable, they still will. They do not want that. There is nothing about people that are using sensational ways of showing themselves as to make themselves desirable in any way, there's nothing respectful about that. I just wanna make sure that's understood. It creates another consequence of self-absorption, and this is, this is where that ends up. Sharing endless selfies, your innermost thoughts on social media creates a very unhealthy self-centeredness often, not always, but often, and it distances you from real life connections. We were just reading something this last week about selfies, the selfie mentality. A ministry was writing on that and compared selfies to narcissism. And I'm not going to say that, but this, this article really did. It, was, it said that there's a link between a continuous selfie poster to narcissism. And so it's something that if you really want people, if, it, if that matters to you, if that matters to you, some people it doesn't, I'm not saying that it should, but if that matters to you that you don't want to be seen as narcissistic and self-centered, you should be cautious about the amount of selfies that you're posting because that is what people by and large think is that you're self-obsessed. These days, most of us access social media through phones, tablets. It's always available. We can always get on social media. So this round-the-clock hyper-connectivity triggers impulse control problems, which is why it's incredibly hard for those in recovery because they already have that. The constant alerts and notifications affect concentration, focus. They disturb sleep, and they make you a slave to your phone. Social media platforms actually design that to do this. Mm -hmm. They want to snare your attention, lock you in, keep you online, and have you repeatedly checking your screen for updates. That's how companies make money. That's why they somehow listen to you and the thing you were talking about shows up in a advertisement right on the side. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how this all works. Mm -hmm. But like gambling compulsion, nicotine addiction, alcohol, drugs, Social media uses the same vehicle to create psychological cravings. And when you receive a like, a share, or a favorable reaction to a post, it triggers the release of dopamine into the brain, the same reward chemical that follows winning a slot machine, taking, eating chocolate, lighting up a cigarette. And the more you're rewarded, the more time you want to spend on social media, even if it becomes detrimental to other aspects of your life, wipes out all your good time with your children, with your spouse, doesn't matter. It serves up like any other addiction. It takes you away from everything that's important. Or you could be present physically, but not present emotionally, mentally, or in any other way because you're fixated on that phone. Other causes of unhealthy social media use the very same tactics to suck people in, to just pull, they, there's brilliant minds that are behind creating these apps and they're all designed to make a lot of money and to trap people in ways that are easy to trap them. Many of us use social media as a security blanket, it's a soother, 
And whenever we're in socially awkward situations and feeling anxious or lonely, people just turn to their phones. It's an easy way to escape or to look like you're not engaged intentionally. They log onto social media and interacting with social media will deny you further opportunities for face-to-face -face interaction that can help ease your anxiety, but many would rather just hide in their phones. The heavy social media use often masks other underlying problems such as stress, depression, boredom. Again, these are plagues for the recovery community that they actually have to overcome to be successful, but they don't because they use one thing to do that. And social media will do that. It'll cure all of these for a moment. It's just like taking your first beer. You didn't end up in jail with your first one, but after a few weeks, you're starting to get in trouble. This social media is the same way. If you spend more time on social media when you're feeling down, lonely, or bored, you're likely only using it to distract yourself from unpleasant feelings or to self-soothe your moods, which is very dangerous to do because that's when it's turning into an addiction. You're using it like an addiction. In a secular world, this could be of no real consequence or issue. They won't make a big deal about it. But if you look at this from heaven side, this is no different than drugs, alcohol, because it's the thing that consumes you. It's the same sin of idolatry. The thing that takes you away from Jesus. Same thing, just a different thing. And while it can be difficult at first, allowing yourself to open up and find healthier ways to manage your moods, it's very much worth it if you want to survive and not keep going back into treatment, back into treatment, back into treatment. And that's what these people tell me. They just can't get out of treatment. A lot of it is they go out of treatment to social media and then down the same spiral back around to treatment, out of treatment to social media. There's a very good reason why treatment centers don't let you have your phones. And it has largely to do with social media. I would say nearly everything to do with social media and texting. Statista.com reported in November of 2020 that on average, Americans aged 18 and up spend more than four hours a day watching TV, which beats the three hours and 45 minutes that they interact with their smartphone on an average day. So if you add TV watching to social media, you're looking at about an eight hour day for the average person. And only eternity is going to reveal the horrible effects of the way that many who claim to be Christian have spent their life because it's all gonna get laid out in detail. It will show exactly, there's a judgment for those who don't go to heaven, but there's also another judgment for those who do go to heaven and our works will be laid out and what wasn't done for Jesus is going to be burned up. Every minute that we wasted is going to show up for what it is. And many will stand before Jesus on the day of judgment. They're going to be shown how much time they spent with Jesus compared to the television, which is even the news. He doesn't care if it's replacing him. And it will be clear that Jesus was not even close to the most important person or he's not a thing, but that he didn't have first place in your life. That social media, TV, pursuit of pleasurable relationships, those three things, I, and together, crowd him completely out. So people have a mental assent and say, I love Jesus, but I promise you, if you were in a real relationship and you spent as much time with that person as you spend with Jesus, they will not stay with you. He won't either. You will hear, depart from me, I never knew you. That's why this is really important. Tim Challies writes in the next story, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion. If we are a distracted people, a distracted society, it stands to reason that we would also be a distracted church 
a church with diminished ability to think deeply, to cultivate concentration, to emphasize slow, deliberate, thoughtful meditation. What Paul said of the unbelieving Jews of his day could likely be said of many of us today. Romans 10, 2, I bear them witness that they may have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Christians may be very excited about God, but because they have become a product of the digital world, they have a diminished ability to even think deeply about him, to truly know him as he is, and more and more of us are finding that we just can't stop long enough to even read the Bible. Sadly, most are so out of touch with what reality is that way, they don't even think this applies to them. It's mathematics. How much time do you spend a day on social media and television and with other people that aren't Jesus focused on those things and how much time do you spend focused on Jesus it's simple mathematics he says I need to be first we can't sustain our attention long enough to study we can't find the time to meet with our father where prayer used to be the first activity of the day we now begin checking email social media where the Bible used to be a special book we read and studied now it's an ebook that competes with our voicemail, text messages, emails, and ever-present lure of the internet in so many forms. Here's one of the great dangers we face as Christians. With the ever-present distractions in our lives, we're quickly becoming a people of shallow thoughts, and shallow thoughts lead to shallow living. There's a simple progression at work here. Distraction to shallow living, or to shallow thinking to shallow living. All of this distraction is reshaping us in two dangerous ways. First, we're tempted to forsake quality for quantity, believing the lie that virtue comes through speed, productivity, and efficiency. We think that more must be better, so we drive ourselves to do more, accomplish more, be more. And second, as this happens, we lose our ability to engage in deeper ways of thinking, concentrated, focused thought that requires time and cannot be rushed, Instead of focusing our efforts in a few directions, we give scant attention to many things, skimming instead of studying. We live rushed lives and forget how to move slowly, carefully, and thoughtfully through life. The challenge facing us is clear. We need to relearn how to think. We need to discipline ourselves to think deeply, conquering the distractions in our lives so that we can live deeply. Because if you don't think, if you don't think or live deeply, you completely miss why you're here. You're just completely missing why you're even created here. You're certainly missing what God wants from you. We must rediscover how to be thoughtful Christians as we seek to live with virtue in the aftermath of all the digital means. We mix worship with our work and pleasure. And why are we surprised when we can only give partial attention to any of them? Christians have long understood that productivity is not easily measured by a spiritual metric, and when we turn to the Bible, we see little demand for constant productivity. It's not in there. Jesus, who maintained a ministry in which he was always in demand, went from one town to the next. The crowds pressed around him, asking him to go this way and that way, heal the sick, cure the lame, and yet Jesus constantly retreated. He would go into the wilderness by himself for long periods of time, to commune with his father. He would enjoy an intimate dinner with his friends. He would gather his few disciples around him and love their company. As the pace grew, Jesus would constantly slow it down in order to keep his focus on what was most important, his father. Where we might keep count of the number of people Jesus healed and those who professed him as Lord, the measure of Jesus' productivity in this way, he kept himself accountable to a much higher measure. Much of his time was not productive in the way that we could easily measure it now, and yet his time was sacred, every moment dedicated to the Father. So this is what is so concerning about many churches and ministries today. It's a numbers count. Every week, it's a numbers count. Mm -hmm. The sad thing is, there's no point in even doing that, because what is it for? Billy Graham himself, we would see masses running down to the altars when he would do an altar call. He says about 98% of the people that responded to his altar calls left the same as they came. They did not follow Jesus. 
So I'm not sure why we're counting salvations and converts at altars, because if we're not making it very clear to them that they are to leave and sin no more, we're working against the cross. We're working against the kingdom. We're actually, this, this is the problem. People come to us, they're so screwed up and they can't get free. And I asked them about being born again and they referenced that they've been saved. They prayed the prayer, their pastor or their chaplain or staff or someone told them they were saved. There is no indication of salvation at all. They do not match anything about Bible salvation. And then they wonder why they are trapped in all this sin because someone who they believed and trusted told them they were saved. And then they think, I'm too bad. I'm too bad for God to fix. I'm too bad for God to see. I'm too bad for God to love. God doesn't hear my prayers. They're not even saved. So what you've done is you've set this person up who trusts you for a terrible walk because they think they're saved, nothing changes. They have the same mess in their heads Nothing changes, and they think, God doesn't care about me. Nothing changed, because they were told they'd have a new life. They would have some sort of um, great experience somehow with this choice, and it doesn't happen. It's a terrible thing to do to this person, to lots of people. Billy Graham, at least, made it very clear what salvation looked like. So if they came forward and prayed the prayer, he made it very clear. If you don't leave and live this out and stay with Jesus, you didn't. You're the, there's three of the four seeds planted in Luke. It talks about how the seed was sown. Three of the four walked away. They did not, that did not develop into salvation. Even though it started out with the potential, they left for the world. They left for cares and and distractions they left they did not walk it out and we need to be very clear with people that if they are coming forward and praying you are not pronouncing them saved do not pronounce them saved you can say we had this many come to the altar but i would not deceive them and tell them they're saved nowhere in the bible did they do that except for the 2,000 that Peter preached to. But we do not see that practice in the Bible. Few of us today have such self-control and such dedication to what matters the most. It, social media has made this hard for everyone. And, and while I do not condemn any social media because you can do amazing things with social media, I believe there's so many helps that can be provided. So many people can be helped by social media that wouldn't necessarily come to a person for help. There's just so many ways that it is a lifesaver, but it's when it's a life stealer and a, and a spiritual life stealer, especially that's when it's treacherous and deadly, just like anything else. Moderation is everything recreated in the image of speedy and productive devices, people got to line up and get the next and the newest and the fastest because they're so stuck on this. We find meaning in speed and constant productivity. And yet many of us wish that life would slow down and become less overwhelming. Most want that. We know that there must be something more than the constant distraction and constant velocity. I know from personal experience that you can get to a position in your life where everyone thinks you've arrived, where you think, where they think this, where she's gotten herself, wow, that's amazing. If she can do that, then that gives hope to everyone. But you can get up there and you can realize this isn't where God wants me. This is not at all where God wants me. I'm drying up, I'm dying on the vine here. I'm losing Jesus here. I'm getting pulled from every single thing that matters to him from my life. And you can suffer pretty significant consequences if you allow that to continue. Many do die on the vine. They choose salary. They choose position. They choose title. They choose public reputation. They choose 
applause over what does God want from me and God wants us to serve the broken be with them not talk at them not there's just I, I learned it personally one of the biggest mistakes I made in my life but God uses everything here I am and I can honestly tell people that happened to me I am so grateful that God jammed that up and gave me clear words to stop and get out he wanted me in with himself doing what he wanted me to do not serving man and in the midst of all this distraction the cure is to refocus our attention on what matters most and that never left me i think all of us who end up in those kinds of places know what matters most we know what matters most and if it doesn't matter most that the people in your care or the people that are watching you that you're setting an example for are not growing closer to Jesus every day and seeing Jesus Christ in how you live, you're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong position. We are to draw people to Jesus Christ by how we are, who we are, how we live, how we talk, our choices. We should never get so lofty and out of reach that we can't be there for those who are where we used to be. Never forget where you came from. What if somebody wouldn't have been there? I would be in hell right now if there was, wasn't a pastor ready on the spot in the middle of the night somehow. I was taken to their house and they let me in, well, whoever my sister brought me, but if they wouldn't have responded to the call that night mm -hmm. and seeing how terrible I was, I was dying at the time from an overdose, they could have easily called 911, they could have easily called an ambulance, any right-minded person would have done that, but they didn't, they prayed. They trusted God. They prayed in the spirit and I was instantly healed and delivered. My mind was made right. That's the difference when somebody is actually listening to God, focusing on what he wants them to do. They get to experience the supernatural, the incredible things. Those who want position, money, power, fame, they're not going to get that. The devil can produce that, but they're not going to be part of God's team. He doesn't choose like that. If our distracted existence is the fruit of allowing tones and beeps to control our lives and turning speed and capacity into divine virtues, then we must respond by silencing the sounds and relearning how to focus the Christian faith requires that Christians use their God-given minds and their God-renewed minds in order to know what is true and to reject what is false. Paul says in Colossians 1, 9 through 10, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is not going to be done on social media. Acts 17, 11 shows that the Bereans received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. We're to be studying the word and living for him. These Berean Christians used their minds to search the Bible to ensure that Paul and Silas were actually teaching the truth. And if we are to do any of this, we need to work tirelessly to eliminate distractions and focus on what matters the most without all the sounds and buzzes and beeps and demand for efficiency. It's just crazy what's expected of people in jobs now because of all the access to every kind of digital and electronic thing. I often think back to um, the old preachers, Finney, Spurgeon, Billy Sunday, 
a lot of these people would do these massive crusades but they had no social media they didn't have email they didn't have texting there weren't even phones and i think of how they had these huge turnouts which you wonder how did they even there must have been newspaper advertising way ahead they would have to plan but people would come for miles and miles and miles to hear them preach the gospel this wasn't a known to be a healing service there wasn't going to be crazy manifestations they came to hear the gospel the truth they wanted the truth and these men had none of the benefits that we do today that can just mass speed up this message which many of us fully take advantage of but yet the fruit was stunning. They had incredible fruit that's still today. I mean, it's still manifesting and doubling and tripling and because they, they were great stewards of their call. They were great stewards of the word. They were very careful how they proclaimed it. They adhered to the truth and the fruit is still coming from that. When we hear a noise, we listen and respond with a turning of our heads, some kind of a response. It's just natural that we do that. Pulls us off what we were doing. So if that's something that we carry with us in our hand and it's making sounds and buzzing and vibrating, we're never going to focus. God created us this way for our own good and our own protection that too much stimulus will keep us from focusing our attention on one thing often the main thing and there's a good reason that libraries are places of quiet and that there's no strobe lights in churches well there shouldn't be as christians we should not be surprised that our technologies often seem to work against us and we know that technology like everything in creation is subject to the curse distraction will never completely disappear as christians we need to use our god-given minds to honor god we have to learn to remain undistracted, to wholeheartedly focus our attention on the things that matter most, and to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. It's not going to change. Judgment Day is not going to change based on what year you were here, how much technology was available to you. It's not going to be a grading on the curve. It's going to be a standard. It's a standard. Melvin Maumer Jr. writes, I came across a story called The Devil's Meeting. The devil called a worldwide meeting of his demons. In his opening address, he said, We cannot keep Christians from going to church. We cannot keep them from reading their Bibles and knowing the truth. The important thing we must do is keep them from forming an intimate relationship with their Savior, Jesus Christ. Once they gain that connection with Jesus, our power over them is broken. So let them go to their churches, but distract them so that they will not have time to build and maintain an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. How shall we do this? The demons replied. Keep them distracted with the non-essentials of life and invent innumerable schemes to occupy their minds, he answered. Tempt them to spend, 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 borrow, 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 to the point that both husband and wife must work in order to just pay the bills and keep them from spending their time with their children. As their families fall apart, their homes will offer no escape from the pressures of life. Overstimulate their minds so that they cannot hear the still small voice of God speaking to them. Hammer them with the news 24 hours a day. Flood their mailboxes with catalog sweepstakes, every kind of newsletter and promotion offering free products, services, false hopes. Keep beautiful models in the magazines on TV so that husbands will believe that outward beauty is what's important. Keep athletically built men on the TV and in magazines so that wives will not look at the character of their husbands, but they will become dissatisfied with them. Give them Santa Claus to di distract them from, the teaching that their from teaching their children about the birth of Jesus Christ. Distract them with the Easter bunny, colored eggs, so that they will not talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and power over sin and death. When they meet for spiritual fellowship and worship, bombard them with superfluous rituals and rhetoric that leaves them with, trouble, with troubled consciences and confused understandings. Soon they will become so distracted that they will start working on their own strength, sacrificing their health and family, and not seeking God at all. It will work. 
It was quite a plan. So the demons went eagerly to their assignments, trying to distract Christians in the non-essentials of life so that they would have little or no time for God, their families, and much less to tell others about Jesus' power to save them and change their life. You have to ask, how successful has that been for you? And it's math again. How much time do you spend with God? How much time do you spend with your family? And how many people are you telling about the power of Jesus Christ to change their life? Simple answer. You can figure it out every day. Distractions are designed to destroy your destiny. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7.35, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. John 10.10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. A destiny in someone's life is the events that will necessarily happen to a particular person or thing in the future. This is something that God has, a story God has planned out. The Bible talks about our destiny. It's very clear what our destiny is. It says in the Bible, this is our destiny. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. There's your destiny right there, everyone. That's it. As Jeremiah 29, 11 says, the expected and or destiny of man to glorify God and enjoy him forever. David said the same thing in Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. You may excel in certain things in life. You can become a great athlete, an entertainer. You can cure cancer. But your destiny is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. These other things are avenues possibly to that. But if they replace you enjoying God and being with him forever, being with him the most, they destroyed your destiny. Doesn't matter how good they are. Unfortunately, we're a generation that is becoming increasingly conditioned to distractions. It's normal. I just talked to someone tonight who said they were offered a tremendous opportunity by a pretty fantastic Christian leader in this community who's teaching people how to boldly share their faith and it's one of the few that I highly respect that really teaches ministry well for streets and any other outreach type. And this person said to me that this was just too much for them that they They can't sit still was the reason they gave for why I can't keep doing this. I can't sit still. I just can't sit still. There's just no way this can work for me. I can't sit still. And so they're going to give this up because this goes on for a few hours and they just said, I, I can't sit still that long. And I think, wow, I'd be working on that problem, not giving up this amazing opportunity but they're deciding to cash in the opportunity because they can't sit still and they're not going to resolve that issue in them, which is so sad. But I've, I've been that person. I've been that person where I can't sit still. But fortunately for me, my life blew up. God crashed me to my face, literally <laughs> knocked me off my horse real high. and. <laughs> He brought me to my knees, not once, but many times he's done that. And he has shown me all the many choices that I have made that got me to that point where I can't sit still. He lets me know that I got myself there. I'm responsible to change that. And he will help me along if I need that. He'll pull out the rug and make it that I have to sit still for a minute and figure out how did you get here again? And so I have that nature. So I get that. And I think that's common for people that are, are active. And a lot of times 
in the ministry, we're just go, 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 go. We just can't sit still. So I say this to myself also, this is something that we have to constantly be mindful of. We have to be repentant of, we have to be turning from, we have got to be able to sit with the broken and listen and not looking at our phone and looking at our phone and looking at our phone and saying, ah, it's gotta go, gotta go, speed it up, get to the short story here. I see it all the time. I've done that. I hate that. I absolutely hate it. It makes me sick that I've done that. There's nothing. I was in a training. Um, it was actually a DBT training and I'm a huge fan of DBT but I was in a training and they did an exercise where they split up the group. We had a pretty big group, a lot of people, we didn't know each other. And so they split the group in half and they took one group to this other room completely away from the rest. So here's one group in one room, one group in the other room. And they tell the group in one room one thing and then they tell us in the other room something else. So they tell us to go in to the room and find someone, find a partner and sit down but we had to pre-think of something that was um, really important to us that we wanted to discuss with this person. So they said, think of something here that's really important to you that you want to talk through with someone. And basically everybody in the room is in therapy or is a therapist or someone that's in a coaching role. So they said, go find someone and then sit down and, and work through this problem with them. That was our assignment. So we go into this room, we find someone we sit down with them. And so we're prepared to really share and hear their um, feedback on our problem that we want them to help us solve. Meanwhile, they've got their phones, they're running over to the snack table, they go get a pop, they're like up and moving around, some go to the bathroom, it's like all of us are just like looking around. The whole point of the exercise was to show to us how a person feels when you do that to them, that if you're going to sit with someone and offer them hope and help, then be present. And this was to give us just an unexpected, raw feeling of what it's like to sit in a chair and have the person who's supposed to help you not even connect with you, not even connect. It was really aggravating. I mean, it was super aggravating. So it was a good thing because most of us don't even realize we're doing this to people. We're doing this to people in our own homes. We're doing this to people at our jobs. We're doing this to people all the time. And that's how aggravating it is. People just have to numb out and know that they don't matter to you. That's where they come to. I've, I've been there. They'll say that to me. You don't even see me. You don't even know I exist. And I tell them, I have a million things going on in my mind. I used to think that was the right thing to say. Now it just makes me sick that I say that and think, there's a reason I don't see you. I'm busy. Mm -hmm. It's disgusting. It is everything but like Christ to be too busy to focus on the people that are around you. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but of the world. It will be a big defeat in eternity if that's what you focus on. The big job, the big salary, the title, fame, power, numbers. Unless you're playing football, don't count numbers in ministry. There is no way to know. This makes identifying distractions easy. They're either dealing with the flesh, the eye, or the pride of life. And these are television, books, movies, music, Facebook, phones, porn. These are distractions caused by the lust of the flesh and lust of the eye. Some invisible distractions are worries, routines, desires, and ambitions. These are the pride of life distractions. So identifying distractions are things that appeal to the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life, and they try to hinder us and oftentimes completely steal our destiny, which is focusing on God and enjoying Him. The effects of distractions are they impede your progress, 
They cause us to drift off course, many times never getting that corrected until you meet Jesus face to face and find out he was not in your life. Just a mental ascent is all. Distractions close off communication with God. They devour the time you should be spending in, in the word. They keep us from growing and living spiritually. They keep us from salvation, actually, in the end. And they cause you to be in a downward spiritual spiral, which many will not recover from. They simply will not stop the distractions. And many of these people are not using drugs and alcohol as their distraction. Sugar, religion, power, fame, applause, relationships the chase of attention is a massive one just seeking attention huge huge one the old saying that sin will take you where you never wanted to go and keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay and cost you more than you can ever pay that's distractions so we have to realize that we're in a spiritual battle 24 hours a day seven days a week Ephesians 6 12 says for we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places and I will say we do deliverance here that's our main thing is prayer ministry and people think that this is their nature their bad behavior a culmination of all their choices they think that all this problem they have mentally and not being able to focus is from them just who they are but what they don't realize is when they sit down and and they start when toddy starts praying in tongues in front of them <laughs> they'll start to realize there's something on the inside that doesn't belong there and it starts causing them some great distress and un in severe uncomfort and distractions that become idols which is anything that is taking more of you than Jesus allows an open door for the devil and I know people have told me my whole life that you cannot be a Christian and have a demon but unless everybody coming to us is not born again which I don't believe because I, 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 I see that they are but trust me, they, are, they will happily tell you that they got free of a demon. That comes in from idolatry. Mm -hmm. Idolatry is a very wicked sin against God. Idolatry is what you serve that isn't him. And most people, it's themselves. Mm -hmm. So you can call yourself whatever you want. You may or may not be born again. I don't know that. But I can tell you that there's often a demon present that is flaring that behavior on high speed. They can't stop without getting rid of it. They are constantly toiling because of that and they don't know it. Nobody's telling them that. The churches aren't talking about demons. Um, programs that should be talking about demons are not talking about demons. But I would say so many people are demonized that don't have any idea. And if they knew they could get rid of it and have peace i was one of those people i got delivered of so many i can't even even imagine what they all were at this point but i was a completely different person after that was over i never used drugs again i never used alcohol again i never smoked cigarettes again i quit swearing profusely so there's a demon of profanity um I, my eating disorder was completely changed after that. There's just so many things. I was flaming for Jesus, flaming from that day on. Never left me. I've chased him ever since, 30 years. That's what it looks like when you don't have demons in you anymore. <laughs> it's amazing. You are flaming for Jesus if he's your pursuit. I would not say to get rid of them if you don't want to be flaming for Jesus because they're not going to leave. So... You don't even need to try to get rid of them if that's not the case. But I'm just saying what very few people will say is that mm -hmm. it's generally helped along by um, passengers that are using your body because they don't have one. So they're pleasuring themselves and enjoying life 
from your body. The devil's persistent. He never gives up. And just as determined as he is in his pursuit to distract us, we also have to overcome distractions. We must put on the whole armor of God to be able to stand. As it says in 2 Corinthians 10.4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God pulling down strongholds. We can help you do that. Most, a lot of this is tied up in strongholds. And when you break agreements with the devil in the area of strongholds, ties to your soul, vows, generational sin, unforgiveness, you pull out the chair of the squatters that are living in you. They cannot stay. They're there because you gave them a reason to be there. You gave them permission to be there. It says, wherefore take the whole armor of God that you will be able to withstand evil in that day and having done all to stand. God definitely paid the price for us to be free, to us to have all, everything focused on him. He paid the price. We don't have to do it. If we stay in sin and we can't concentrate and we can't focus and we can't sit still and we can't pay attention, I guarantee you the other side has control. And you should probably try to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Most of us have a difficult time slowing down and spending time with the Bible because of distractions. But whether it's a spiritual attack or a battle with the sinful nature, there's a lot of things that we can do to combat them. Simple process, harder to work out, but it's a process that if you choose a time when your mind is clear in the day and you're less likely to be distracted, choose the best time of the day for God, the best window. It doesn't have to be 6 a.m. or 4 a.m. If it's late morning for you, he's not, it, he just wants the time. Choose the best window for God. Find a place where you can focus, where you're not constantly going to be interrupted. If you keep doing this and you keep meeting him in that place at that time, your brain will begin to automatically set itself into that habit. Mm -hmm. And when you go there to the same place, it's going to become, it'll just become a glorious routine for you. Not hard. It, it will start out hard, but it will become something you don't want to live without. Journal or pray your problems, disappointments, frustrations, and joys. Anything that's on your mind that's going to keep you from focusing, write it down, journal it, or pray it to God. All the things on your mind, get it out of your head mm -hmm. so that you can focus. Mm -hmm. And then sit quietly so that your mind can settle. If your mind wanders, have a piece of paper. For some of us, our minds are always wandering. Have a piece of paper right by you so if something comes into your mind that you really need to remember, write it down and move on. Just write it down and move on. Keep doing that. Eventually, you'll get better in this and that won't become... It's just going to be that way probably to start. But even regardless, just keep that paper there and write things down if they come into your mind that you need to remember. God might even speak to you and you'll want to remember that. So always have paper and pen, but don't let stuff just stick in your head and keep you skipping mm -hmm. on that thing. If your time becomes routine, switch up how you spend that time. Write out the word. I've done that many times. Write out the word. So now they've got color the word. You can buy amazing coloring books where you can journal. It's got like devotional coloring books, coloring Bibles. You can, if you're one that needs to do that you can try reading out loud there's many different things that you can do to change it up change your spot do something but don't let it become to where you can check out and do it distractions happen to all of us and guilt about being distracted adds another distraction i was just with someone before i came here who's received a pretty serious cancer diagnosis and she was talking to me about how frustrated she became had a family member today and she's just had three surgeries in the last few weeks and she's just like she became so impatient with a family member and was just in the guilt of that and I thought I said you gotta let that go I said you can't this you've got about you got quite a lengthy process ahead of you and I know that from my husband that I, I wasn't even the one that was enduring the cancer I was the one that was living they're trying to, you know, catch the gaps and serve him. 
but I know I did that. And I had fortunately had someone I could call and just like lose it because there's times you're just, so she was talking about the guilt that she felt over how she kind of just lost it today. And I thought you're in such considerable, just a terribly traumatic experience. Your body, when they, you have surgery, that's like being in a car wreck. She's had three of them. Plus she's doing treatment. I was like, it's, it's amazing how we, the guilt, let it go. Same about this, let it go. Don't, we're a mess, like we're a mess. On our best day, we're a mess. Like it's, it is what it is. But guilt adds to the distractions, let it go. Simply pray and ask God to help you focus. Never give up, never give up. I say that especially to those who feel that they are saved, born again, and they have no experience with God at all. They have never encountered God in a living way to where he's anything but a head knowledge God to them. I would tell you, I don't know how you do it. I honestly don't know how you do it. I couldn't do it. He has got to become real to be a real relationship. And he wants that worse than you do. He wants it way worse. If you are somewhere and your spiritual climate around you is not allowing you to know God for real in a real living active way, get out. <laughs> Seriously, get out. There is people who would, there are living, real living communities. Mm -hmm. Call us. We would love to help you. I don't know how people do it. I really don't. I had a pastor say to me once when he'd heard my story, he's like, you, you've experienced a miracle for like, you really have seen a miracle. I said, I'm living a miracle. I am a miracle. And he said, he'd been pastoring so many years. He says, I've never seen a miracle. I've never seen a miracle. I don't know how people do it. God so badly wants to just burst out in power all around us. If he's not, whose fault is that? Right. Ours. So don't give up and definitely go to where people are going to push you right into Jesus. Yeah. Like you're going to run right into him. Mm -hmm. You'll know he's real. And like everything, this all gets easier with time. Training is hard work to begin with on the mind, but being this connected to God is crazy amazing. Mm -hmm. It produces so much. There's no chance that social media is half one court, one tenth as invigorating as being in active, real ministry with the spiritual realm. It is worth the struggle. So never give up. Press all the way to him. Precious Lord, we all need your help. We all have a struggle with distractions. And I ask that you would help us just help us because so much of the kingdom work is being left undone people are being throttled into eternity every minute because they were not reached no one spent the time with them to really tell them what was coming if they didn't surrender their lives to jesus christ help us god not to be those people that are so stuck in our own heads on our phones, on the TV, in a relationship that we cannot care about those around us that, are, that will go lost if someone doesn't reach them. And we know that time is coming to a close. Help us not to get complacent. Help us not to be like others that are just like, I'll pay attention when I have to. So many more will die by then. Jesus, have mercy on us and please help us. Our desire is to please you, to honor you. And we do, we are eager to meet you face to face. And we know that's coming soon. So I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would just bring clarity to everyone, more so than convict them that you would give them a passion to throw down their distractions and seek you above all things. 
that you would be their heart's desire, that you would be the one they chase. You would be the great pearl, the great prize, the one that they cannot stop chasing. Please just change their minds and help them to choose you over all the petty distractions this world is offering. We love you, Jesus. We just abandon ourselves completely to you as a ministry and ask that you help us to stay focused, to be what you called us to be. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.